Correct. Thank you, Tom. Right. Uh, good afternoon and uh, good evening to everybody and welcome to our global policy webinar on dignity, inequality and populism. My name is Ava Maria Nagan. I'm the editor of Global Policy Journal at the School of Government and International Affairs at Durham University. Uh, this is the northeast of England in lockdown mode. Before we start, I'd like to thank Tom, Global Policy's web editor, Tom Kirk, for taking on the crucial job of housekeeping. Uh, you are being let in by him now as I speak, um, and we look forward to hearing from you later. To follow his guidance, please keep your microphones muted and your videos turned off until the open Q&A session. And you may later send in the comments and uh, your comments and thoughts using the chat function. And a lot of you will be familiar with uh, using Zoom, so I'm hoping this will all work out just fine. Um, on my side, I'm delighted to host this discussion based on a timely and important article by Ravi Abdullah published in the September issue of Global Policy Journal. And it is free to access until October 20th. So please make a note of that to download and read the paper. It's worth it. Um, I will briefly introduce the panelists who, as you will see, come from a variety of disciplines and take up various positions on the questions at hand, um, which is a wonderful thing. And this promises um, a very productive debate on concepts, norms, policy conundrums and policy solutions to some of these big issues. To introduce the speakers in the order of their respective talks, um, it is my pleasure to first welcome Professor Ravi Abdullah, author of Dignity, Inequality and the Populist Backlash, Lessons from America and Europe for a Sustainable Globalization. Ravi is the Joseph C. Wilson Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. The next speaker will be Professor Michael Rosen, who is the Senator Joseph S. Clark Professor of Ethics in Politics and Government at Harvard University as well. Professor Rosen will offer some conceptual thoughts on dignity to which I will briefly add, um, very briefly, before turning to Professor Peter Hall, who is a Krupp Foundation Professor of European Studies in the Department of Government at Harvard University. I'm also delighted to welcome one of our very active and dedicated board, journal board members um, to the discussion, Dr. Marianne Le Bourg, Senior Economist at Deutsche Bank and lecturer at Harvard University. And Marion's comments will be followed by Dr. Henning Meyer, Fellow of the German Ministry of Finance and Research Associate at the Judge Business School at the University of Cambridge. So we're, we're looking forward to um, a very interesting panel discussion and of course to engaging with um, the audience um, afterwards. Uh, Ravi, over to you. I believe you will take five minutes and um, we'll follow up with Michael straight after. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Eva, and uh, thank you to the global policy team. I'm really grateful for everything that uh, went into getting my article on its way toward publication, and many, many thanks to Eva for suggesting that we put together a panel. I'm shocked and amazed that Michael and Marion and Henning and Peter decided to take time out of their day today to share some thoughts on the ideas in the article and their own thoughts about what's going on in the world. So I'm really thrilled and really very grateful. And I'm mostly here, I think, to take notes uh, from their commentary. Uh, I, I hope to learn quite a lot. I just wanted to say a few words about the ideas in the article, or at least where the article uh, came from intellectually and in practice. I have been, uh, like many of us, thinking about the legitimacy crisis of globalization that has been growing mostly in the West for the, na the last 10 or 15 years. And certainly in the United States and France, both countries in which there has been a kind of backlash presented through a language and narrative of populism and anti-elitism, anti-establishment, anti-globalization. The backlash has been more muted in Germany, which is, I think, itself an interesting contrast. It exists, of course, but not nearly as thoroughly uh, defining the political moment as it is in countries like the United States and France. And for a decade, I would have told you that there was some mix of cultural conservatism and nationalism along with uh, 
the material challenges of how these economies function. Some element of income inequality combined with these cultural and social movements that had produced this moment of legitimacy crisis for globalization. And I have been reading the work of some of my colleagues, including the work of Peter Hall on questions of social integration, which I have increasingly come to see as really essential for making sense of what has been happening. In a particular moment, professionally, helped me, I think, to begin to make sense of what I at least imagined to be one of the central challenges of this legitimacy crisis. I was teaching a Harvard Business School case on France, in particular in the last French election, and the rise of Front National and Marine Le Pen to make it into the second round of that contest. It was written by a colleague of mine here at Harvard Business School, an economist named Vincent Pons. And the second time I was teaching this Harvard Business School case, I discovered in the data, in the case, the net Gini coefficient of France, which I found staggeringly interesting. And for giving the nerdiness, I don't need to apologize to Marion because I think she's happy to go fully down the nerdy path with me on the data. But what I found most interesting is that although the net Gini coefficient of France had not changed almost at all, in the last 30 years, in fact, it had gone down, the gross Gini coefficient had increased. So a, a moment of, of pause for the nerdiness, the gross Gini coefficient is the level of income inequality that prevails in a society before the state intervenes. So before the state taxes and transfers income. And then the net Gini coefficient is after the state intervenes. And so what I found shocking in a way was that the gross Gini coefficient for France looked very similar to that of the United States. Both nations had experienced over the last 30 or so years a sharp increase in income inequality. The net Gini coefficient in the United States also experienced a sharp increase. So in fact it increased even more than the gross Gini coefficient, which suggests that perhaps the the US state had been regressive in its approach to intervening in the outcome. But the French had put up this extraordinary fight against material income inequality as an outcome after the fact. And yet, the French still, still seemed very disappointed with, frustrated by globalization, still with this very powerful backlash, despite the fact that France had undertaken this extraordinary redistribution, essentially to bring the, the felt income inequality down to levels below what they were 30 years ago. And this to me was fascinating. One implication was that perhaps the redistribution of income would not likely by itself be a way to manage the challenges associated with our great age of inequality. But the second one, and this is uh, the one that really got me thinking more broadly, was that if it's not just the material fact of inequality or the material fact of redistribution that is central to the populist backlash against globalization, then what is it? It must be something else, something social, something cultural, something psychological. And as I reread the, the language used to describe the frustrations with globalization in the United States and in France over the past 10 years, what kept coming out from that narrative was a sense of frustration about being unable to contribute to the economy and to society meaningfully. A, a sense of frustration that the dignity and meaning and purpose associated with productive work had been 
unevenly distributed in both societies, even though the income distribution had been quite different after the state intervened. So it was really that something else going on that led me over the past few years to try to make sense of how I would tell the story beyond the material facts. And I am very excited to hear what everybody else has to say. I have my pen and paper. I'm basically here to take notes and I'm delighted to have the chance to be part of the conversation. And so thank you again, everyone for joining us. Thank you very much, Ravi. That's uh, great. And uh, yes, the, the, the big questions here to be answered. Um, not sure we can do it this afternoon, but we'll try. Um, and I'd like to invite Michael Rosen to offer his thoughts. Um, and looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I should say, first of all, thank you to everyone for organising this. I'm incredibly grateful to join the panel uh, to talk about Ravi's, uh, if I may, uh, extremely interesting and thought provoking reflections on our present discontents. And I think there are two reasons why I'm particularly grateful. First of all, I'm gonna be very honest, um, I can hardly think of anything else these days. And I think that having these thoughtful, well-informed people with such different perspectives uh, to share their thoughts may well have a therapeutic value for me. Um, there's also something else that I have to confess right at the front, which is that philosophers very rarely get invited to this kind of interdisciplinary panel. And uh, when they're invited, they're very rarely, even more rarely invited back. And I, I think I should start by being honest and explaining why that tends to be. During the war on the BBC, there was an extremely popular radio program called the Brains Trust. And it was really a, a sort of collection of people with various sorts of expertise and readers would ask them anything. And anyway, one of the people on the panel uh, was a philosopher now forgotten called Professor C.E.M. Jode, and he became famous, notorious perhaps famous, because he would always start, to start his answers uh, with the phrase, well, it depends on what you mean by so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, I'm indeed going to do that. I do understand that it's not everyone's cup of tea, but I think it's a deformation professionnelle uh, that we do that. Before that though, if I may, I'm going to talk a bit about the structure of uh, Ravi's paper, because I, I think that, um, you know, looking at it uh, with some, uh, some, some, some clarity, if I can, uh, may be helpful. So he says that the problem that he sees is how to restore the legitimacy of global capitalism um, in the face of glo globalization. Now, why is that problematic? Um, in general, as he says, globalization is, I'm, 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 I'll let you know when I'm quoting again, a story of those who feel left behind by the integration of markets for goods, services, and capital. And as he rightly said in his introductory remarks, the general story that people tell about this is a story about inequality. But again, as he pointed out, um, France. And if it's the case, that France, as I'm sure uh, he has demonstrated, has maintained a very high degree of income equality or a lower degree of income inequality than elsewhere. And nevertheless, the French are opposed to globalization. It points, Ravi says, um, very uh, strongly to the thought that ideas matter. I quote again, money cannot buy dignity or status. So with that, Ravi turns us to Germany, where things are different. As he says, 60% of Germans still believe that globalization is a force for good. Which then brings him to uh, the question, what is Germany, again a quote, what is Germany doing right that France and the United States have been doing wrong? To which he answers, again a quote, the German system produces a manageable distribution of dignity. The German model helps citizens find meaning and purpose through their contributions to society by their labor. And he goes on to specify three areas in which Germany is, he believes, 
distinctively successful uh, in their financial system, in their educational system, and in their support for social mobility. I should say that I've spent uh, a fair bit of my life off and on uh, uh, the, in, in Germany. I'm an, uh, uh, an honorary professor at the Humboldt Uni University. I studied in Germany and I even, even have a German daughter. So um, I, I, Germany is, 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 is close to my interests. Um, I will confess though that I also find it um, quite bewildering, but there's another matter. So I now move to comments and I'll start with two major matters of agreement. First of all, and it's refreshing to hear this, uh, uh, the, those of you, I think I suppose it's most, who are joining us not from the United States uh, will take this for granted, but for those of us who spend our intellectual life principally in the United States, it's refreshing to find that uh, someone who asserts very clearly that our present discontents aren't just US specific. As uh, Tolstoy says, every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Um, and certainly it's true that all dysfunctional polities are dysfunctional in their own way. But it would be beyond coincidence to think that so many of the, uh, the, the, the uh, countries in the liberal democratic capitalist world are going through crises of identity and legitimation to think that this is a purely uh, an aggregation of local phenomena. And if so, they can't be purely about economics. I wholly agree. Globalization has produced winners as well as losers. But the problems, it seems to me, seem much more widespread. So now, briefly and bluntly, some questions. First of all, what does Ravi see as the problem? He says it's the legitimacy of globalization. I wonder about that. Surely I'm concerned at least much more that people are undermining the norms and structures of liberal democracy. I'm much more worried about the second than I am about the first. Now perhaps the two to go together but it's actually very important to Ravi's argument because the evidence he adduces in relation to Germany is that 60% of Germans are in favor of globalization, which is about the first issue. But that would seem to imply that there aren't any strong internal challenges to liberal democracy in Germany itself. Whereas, and I say this without any data, I think that seems to be false, surely. Think of Pegida, think, Pegida, think of the AfD, and so on. I don't think Henning will give me any, uh, any argument that Germany too feels vulnerable, uh, to, and, and, and perhaps uh, even uh, more surprisingly. Now, as I say, I used to think I understood uh, Germany's success as a modern capitalist economy, certainly as a Brit who's been studying uh, politics and economics for 50 years, it's hard not to have reflections on the subject. After all, uh, it was and has been since the 1960s, uh, the central question of the political class and economic class in Britain. Why are the Germans so successful and apparently more than us? But now I'm not so sure. And one thing that I would certainly want to, uh, to, to question that Ravi asserts is that the educational system is beyond Question. I'm sure Henning will be able to say more about this, but uh, in 2001, the PISA study um, carried out by UNESCO produced in Germany what uh, was called a PISA shock uh, to uh, correspond to the shock that the West underwent when the, the Russians put up their Sputnik. It was the, the thought that uh, Germany uh, scored extremely badly and for very understandable reasons in its educational system. I'm looking at the time um, and I will move swiftly. So finally, I will come to my Joad moment. It depends on what you mean by dignity. So what does dignity mean? I only have a minute and a half and my answer is it's complicated. I've written a book on the subject in which I try to explain what I think. But in as much as it applies to Ravi's very interesting uh, article, 
The question is, is dignity something to be distributed, as he says? After all, the Germans say, die Würde des Menschen ist unantastbar, sie zu achten und zu schützen ist Verpflichtung aller staatlichen Gewalt. So if that's the case, is dignity something that we all have equally, or is it rank, status, place, or esteem? Ravi says money can't buy dignity or status. And then that uh, pushes us back to the thought. If Germany has a flourishing and functional way of distributing dignity, why now does it seem to, to have hit a situation of uh, discontent? Why is the economically flourishing hegemon of the Euro currency zone also facing nationalism, Islamophobia, and let me be quite frank, resurgent fascism? If so, we should all be worried, and worried is what I am. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. That was uh, wonderful thoughts and uh, mirroring some of mine, I guess. So um, I'll take up the baton here and um, go on with a few big picture comments. Um, Ravi, so thank you again for your wonderful paper. And what I'm picking up on um, is your comment that we need to bring dignity to the fore as a policy tool, and, and that is an intriguing idea. And again, um, I'm with Michael here in thinking about what, is it, what does that actually mean? So the three, I've got three points to make. Two are related to labor and employment and the third to the public sphere. So the first big point that um, strikes me as being fairly important is that there's a challenge of gender that needs to be addressed when it comes to the idea of dignity. Um, and this relates back to populism. So while populist movements not easily lump together, despite some of their commonalities, but it is fairly clear that socially conservative populist movements um, do not espouse universal participation in the dignity according right to labor, for instance, and work. So we, we do have problems here. Um, indeed, female labor force participation rates across the world vary and are, are quite patchy. Um, these rates have been steadily increasing in European countries, um, but interesting in the US we see a stagnation and actually a decline, a steady decline, uh, not steady, but a notable decline since about 2000, which is worth noting. So I would say that although the reasons are complex and have to be differentiated by regions also within the US, um, I think comparisons with emerging economies in the global south show that there are significant correlations between the strength of socially conservative movements that espouse dignity for themselves, you know, where, where you bring up that it's, it, they, they felt left behind somehow. But these correlate with exclusion of women from the domain of labor. And that's something uh, to look at when looking at dignity as a policy tool. And the, the trajectories of post-World War II European countries are a historical case in point where we have seen this happen. So this means that it would be incumbent on policymakers to take seriously the idea of dignity as the universal norm um, and linking it to all human beings and delinking it from social status and social worth. Whereby dig if, if, if you delink uh, or if you take that seriously, the, the latter meaning, then you are um, you're tying dignity to exclusivist and hierarchical notions of status and honor. Um, and again, this is worth considering how, how do you, where's the thin fine line that policymakers um, can easily tread? And I think this could be a problem. So the to my mind, the abstract freedom to work and participate thus has to be realized within real labor markets and the laws and regulations governing these markets, but they have to be looked through a, a more universal lens than has been so far the case. Um, I think very currently, I would say Afghanistan is, is a really interesting case study where we can see uh, peace deals being struck and, but the, and, and on employment, labor markets and education, for instance, where it is questionable whose dignity matters more, is, you know, um, who's, who's, well, whose rights. The second um, issue I want to flag um, coming out of your paper, which I, you know, again, 
what really I thought was quite interesting was um, the, 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 the notion of labor and its meaning in the context of uh, the Anthropocene, which is a very new context we find ourselves in. So when we argue that dignity can be used as a universal attribute of human beings, we, can, we also argue and have argued in the past that dignity has a specific external source, not just within humans, but linked to their ability um, to, 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 to work, to labor, in other words. So employment, making a living, providing for oneself, one's family, um, the ability to contribute to society, they were linked for a number of centuries and, and possibly more so since the Enlightenment, the European Enlightenment, to notions such as added value, growth, consumption, security, and other related meanings. And today, I think the terms of the debate um, are fast changing with a growing sense, not just among scientists and experts, but also among sort of more general populations that we have entered into a new and very uncertain era. So we're seeing, and I can say this safely for global policy, we're seeing quite radical ideas such as degrowth, zero growth, um, flat growth um, coming up. And what does that mean for, for labor? And how then does that translate back into the notion of dignity when linked to the idea of labor? So there, I think this is, uh, this is more of a big question. This is not, not, not uh, an answer by any means. Um, so I think we might want to now look at dignity um, and delinking de it from the idea of value added labor. So taking away lock a little bit um, and valorizing meaning, perhaps. And this is something you do flag, Ravi, and I think you use terms interchangeably. I, I think we, there may be a case for making them, for differentiating between them rather than using them interchangeably, um, given the new context. So. I think, again, here's a challenge for policymakers, which is finding new instances of connecting individual dignity with labor and employment in ways more appropriate to the times we find ourselves in. And of course, we're still arguing how, how to describe these times and what can be done. But I, I think we won't get around um, a discussion of that. Uh, third, and here's my final point, um, I'd like to sort of go back to um, the work of Jürgen Habermas a little bit. And his claim that uh, the abstract and universal idea of dignity has been a source of human rights, or rather the violations of the instances of dignity, um, have, have led to the formulation of specific rights. Um, and in order to be part of the political and social world, in reality, have to find their ways into institutions and legal orders of distinct political communities. So it is only in a, in a political community that rights can be enforced and dignity can be respected. So in this sense, for Habermas, dignity has already performed the function of a political tool, um, which is, or as he puts it, dignity is a portal, and I'm quoting Habermas here, through which concepts of universalism and egalitarianism travel and are imported into law. However, um, I think again here we need to to ask some questions because this construct works when there's evidence, when there's real evidence for an overlapping consensus on what dignity actually entails. And when there's consensus on what its violations entail. I, I, I don't think we can just take that, those violations for granted and assume that we know when it is that dignity is violated. And I think those are also quite difficult questions in, in the concrete to answer. The construct also works best when there is an ability of citizens to freely participate in the shaping of norms, laws, and government. Um, and there also, and this is a, to connect to Michael's point, we, we, we're seeing problems with this, with uh, liberal democracies, um, sort of, I don't external threat, but also internally. So where do we find ourselves now? What happens when the public sphere is fragmented or captured by special interests to the extent we see it now in, in many cases? And when there's little evidence for a workable overlapping consensus in describing the world, in analyzing it and finding solutions? Um, so again, this is a big question. So for me, populism is not a single movement, even though there are commonalities, but I'm seeing a lot of populisms in the plural in place. And this means 
are there going to be different types of dignities that we need to think about? Um, because at the moment we're working with a very optimistic idea of dignity as a tool to push back the fragmentation that Habermas was interested in. But he looked at it through the lens of competing interpretations. What happens when there isn't that space for interpretation? In other words, when fragmentation is so clear cut and um, we're so apart that it's not about competition or, um, or difference, but about parallel worlds. And I think this is where um, some, the tool of dignity might actually fail a little bit. So if the various groupings that view violations of dignity as specific and unique and singular to their interests, how robust is the concept of dignity as a tool of interconnection of several kinds of inter interests? And that, that's a question I do have. So here, with these questions, I see an enormous challenge for connecting dignity with the now highly differentiated claims to rights, justice, and recognition, and linking them to these highly differentiated spaces we see in, 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 a, in the globalized world, which are these are very diff these are very far apart social, political worlds, and also spaces of labor. Labor markets also highly fragmented. And is dignity in the Habermasian sense now enough of a tool? And again, this is a question I'd like to end, end on. And um, here, and I think probably ends the conceptual part, and we, we will probably now move to the, to the data. Um, and I'm very pleased that Peter Hall will be speaking now. And uh, thank you, Peter. Thanks, Eva. Thank you very much for inviting me to comment on this very provocative paper by my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Rawi Abdullal. Um, I want to sig signal, and I will signal a few points of strong agreement uh, with the paper. Uh, but uh, Bill Cosby once said that whether you see a glass as half empty or as half full depends on whether you're pouring or whether you're drinking. And as a commentator, of course, I'm drinking. Uh, so I'm going to have to identify a few points of uh, disagreement. Uh, let me start with uh, points of agreement. And I'll be relatively brief because I want to leave time for people to ask questions. Um, Yes, uh, while I certainly think that a robust social policy is important in this uh, era of globalization, I agree with Rawi that uh, redistribution is not going to, in itself, uh, dissolve the populist backlash. Uh, seeing this as a problem of compensation, as many IR scholars do, uh, has some merit, uh, but does not speak uh, to the problem. And in that sense, I think the broad import of the paper is exactly on target. Uh, and indeed, some of my own research suggests that uh, supporters of right populist parties, for instance, are not actually very supportive of redistribution, uh, probably because they think a lot of it goes to immigrants uh, and they're interested in drawing strong boundaries between themselves uh, and immigrants for reasons we could discuss. And so, yes, I think the emphasis that Rawi puts on dignity is uh, exactly right. Uh, the New York Times, as it happens, carried an article a few days ago, uh, which quoted a Trump voter in Pennsylvania uh, as saying this. This is Can anyone hear me? Um, Peter, I've lost Peter at my end. Peter's back, but he's muted. There we go. So did you lose me? Did you lose my wonderful quote from the New York Times? We lost you right before the quote. Oh, before the quote. Oh, God, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know what's wrong with my connection. Well, here, this is um, a, a quoting a Trump voter in Pennsylvania uh, saying this. Uh, Look, Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party make me feel bad about myself. Donald Trump makes me feel good about who I am. I only have a high school education, but I got a good union job. I go to work every day. Why am I a bad guy? Hillary's calling me deplorable. And I think that quote speaks volumes. 
Uh, and for Rowie's argument, it really cuts both ways. On the one hand, uh, it does suggest that dignity is central, and I think that's right. On the other hand, it suggests uh, that the structure of the economy is not all that matters uh, to dignity. Uh, this has something to do with how people think about other people, uh, the character of public discourse about who has a worth in society and who does not. Uh, Michael Sandel's recent book, along with some others, about meritocracy, I think is very relevant here. Uh, the notion uh, that has become increasingly uh, prominent that um, we get what we deserve uh, tends to blame those who don't get very much for not getting very much. And there's a way in which um, that uh, speaks to people's dignity. There's a way in which uh, this uh, divide that has become increasingly important in the knowledge economy between people who have a college education and people who do not uh, is something that is a, uh, a matter for political discourse to address as well as something we need to address at the level of the economy. Now, moving closer to Rowie's argument, um, of course, many things matter to dignity. There is more than one way to secure dignity, and uh, Michael's book about this subject is uh, something I would recommend. Uh, but certainly, uh, one thing that matters a lot, in my view, is employment. And what I would call uh, the key variable here is access to a decent job. Uh, by a decent job, I mean a job that's relatively well paid so you can support your family and a job that isn't so precarious that you're afraid you're going to lose it uh, next week or the week after. And I think this emphasis on employment is entirely consonant with uh, Rowie's uh, overall argument. Indeed, uh, in citing the case of France where the populist backlash is um, very strong, uh, Rowie might have noted and uh, maybe uh, Marianne will have more to say about this. Rowie might have noted that uh, more than two thirds of all jobs created in France in the last several years have been temporary positions. And not just temporary positions, but temporary positions where the contract runs for less than a month. There's something about uh, employment security that matters here. And um, uh, I think that uh, is an important thing to signal. So. Um, if we think that having access to a decent job is really crucial, uh, at least two things matter, uh, I would say. The first is equality of opportunity. Does everyone have a chance to get a decent job? And uh, this is something Rawi emphasizes, and I think here he's quite right uh, to emphasize it uh, and to point to the importance in the U.S. in particular of raising the quality and standardizing the quality of primary and secondary education and providing a better vocational training. So if equality of opportunity is the first uh, a key factor that seems to me to matter in this context, the second, which might be emphasized more than it is in the paper, I think, is a matter of raising the quality of existing jobs. Uh, we need a living wage, more benefits and protections for workers and the like, basically so that the working poor are no longer poor. Uh, and, you know, that may seem like a truism, but it's more than a truism in the political climate that we live in uh, today. And this uh, takes me in closing, because I want to leave time for discussion, to two points of uh, friendly disagreement uh, with the paper. First, um, if we're thinking uh, about the broad uh, issue in terms of dignity, uh, and in my terms, access to decent jobs, I think attitudes to globalization are a bit of a red herring here. Uh, those attitudes uh, are a function of political discourse more than anything else. Yes, they can be linked to the structure of the economy. The fact that Germany is such a powerful export economy surely inclines many people to be more supportive of globalization. Uh, but I think it's no wonder that there's antipathy to globalization, as the paper notes, in France and the US. As Rawi knows very well, because he's written uh, many things about France, uh, French governments for the past several decades have essentially attacked globalization, demonized it, wh while effectively uh, supporting it uh, behind closed doors in the European Union. And in the US, we also see a strong anti-globalization uh, discourse. 
So I think this aspect of the backlash is in large measure a political uh, creation. Uh, and my second uh, point uh, is that I'm not yet convinced that better support, uh, financial or otherwise, uh, for small and medium-sized enterprises is quite as central to the solutions here as my reading of the paper uh, suggests. There are a lot of small and medium-sized enterprises in the US, uh, and yes, there's more churn among them than in Germany, uh, but uh, I would accord the strength of the German trade union movement and uh, the long-standing public regulation of working conditions, which Wolfgang Strake has once called beneficial constraints, as much more important uh, to uh, the outcomes that uh, Rowley uh, discusses in the paper. So if there's time for Rowley to answer uh, questions, and if I don't stop talking, there won't be, uh, I'd like to hear more uh, to persuade me that this issue of supporting small and medium-sized enterprises is really uh, the feature of the political economy on which we should concentrate. But I enjoyed very much reading the paper. I heartily endorse its main message and I'm grateful to have the chance to comment on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for your comments. And I think I'm sure we'll have time for Ravi and others to, to comment on, on, on your uh, your notes, and this is very helpful. Um, Marion, uh, can you ca take up from here? Thank yes, you very much. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, many thanks, Eva and Ravi, for the invitation today. I'm very glad to be part of this amazing panel. And uh, Ravi, let me say that I have really enjoyed reading your paper, and uh, I shared most of your views actually. So I have shared, I have prepared a few slides and uh, first let me start with a few thoughts on your paper. Uh, you did a very great job at explaining the situation and um, I have two things that I wanted to specifically add on. First, uh, you have this uh, grid chart I found very interesting here when you look at historical data for the educational attainment of adults American over 25 years. And I found it pretty interesting and I would love to have your thoughts on that because uh, as you explained, uh, the number of higher education degrees sharply increased. And what struck me basically, it's as you can see here on the right hand side, shot that uh, higher festive. It occurs at a time when tuition costs have grown at quick speed. And here, as we can see, in less than four decades, the cost of attending a public four college in the US has been multiplied by four. And at the same time here, on this flat line, I have included the median American household income, which has also remained relatively stable at the same time. So as a result, the student loan debt in the US has grown rapidly since uh, 2008, and uh, it's now around $1.6 trillion in uh, 2019, which is just high as well. Second thing that uh, you also mentioned, uh, you mentioned that within inequality has uh, increased, specifically in France and in the US. But um, I wanted to say that actually globally, uh, we tend actually to see half of the picture because if we look at the full and global picture, the worldwide picture, we can uh, see that the truth is slightly different. And since 1980s, the gap between low and high income countries has been steadily narrowing. And this has led to the continuous phenomenon of convergence between countries. And we have been moving away from a grid divergence across countries in the world toward a period of grid convergence in which inequality between countries since the 1980s has been free. And so for the 1990s, if we look at the cumulative GDP of emerging countries, uh, it was around barely a third of the community GDP of the G7 countries. And by 2016, this gap had actually virtually disappeared. And this is probably mainly uh, driven by significant income growth in low-income countries, and particularly China, 
as the middle class uh, has been risen very strongly. So in your paper, uh, you also mentioned uh, very quickly the COVID-19, and uh, I wanted to add two things on that. The COVID-19 uh, is actually unlikely uh, to revert this inequality trend within countries. So if we go back to the US inequality, which is the main point of your paper, if we look at the short term, uh, the COVID-19 is clearly unlikely to revert this uh, within the inequality trend, as most countries have ordered uh, work from home when possible, and the higher paid office-based workers are benefiting from this work from home activities. And the situation is uh, complicated because up to now, government share of schemes have been very supportive for those on low income, but uh, this is very unlikely that government will be able to extend the support forever as well. So the low income group may be most at risk for any structural changes to the economy in the immediate and the medium term post COVID landscape. So inequality could uh, easily initially increase during that time. So if we look at the two pictures I have passed here, the first figure show the top 10 occupations among low wage American workers. And uh, this highlights actually the problem because many of these jobs will be difficult in a socially distancing world and uh, thus continue to be vulnerable in the immediate future. And if we look at the second picture here at the other end of the spectrum, uh, this figure shows how much easier it has been for those on the highest income to work from home who are less at risk in terms of immediate job security. In terms of uh, the long-term trends, so if we go back to uh, inequality here, we, we can see uh, that inequality actually began to widen around the 1980s here. And it is already now at extreme levels where politicians are more united than ever in trying to tackle the issue. And the low paid uh, workers are suffering much more in this immediate post COVID landscape situation. And the wealthier are being better protected. And this will uh, create much more inequality tensions and the need for politicians to react. So we can expect uh, some pressures for taxes to go up after the pandemics, and especially for the highest paid and the most powerful companies. So as you can see on the second chart, uh, which uh, where I have passed the statutory corporate income tax rate, there is a little doubt that the, the period since the early 1980s has been very favorable for corporates, and globalization has uh, probably helped them in many ways with cheap labor, access to wider pool of consumers, a competitive tax environment where countries have conducted a tax arms race to encourage domestic investments and jobs. So here, basically, this chart highlights the continuous downward trend that we are seeing in the statutory corporate income tax rates since the 1980s. And in many ways, uh, the falling corporate tax rate is also the ultimate expression of inequality that uh, you mentioned several times in your paper, as it has been a huge boost for capital over labor. Now, um, I want to end um, my thoughts on a positive note, since uh, most people are very pessimist during these days, I wanted to, to add a little more positive note at the end. So dignity, populism, and inequality are what we can call the multifaceted area. And we can also see uh, here an, interne an intergenerational divide at the same time. And for now, this general divide is at really relatively extreme levels. Those who have graduated into the labor market over the last decade have already experienced uh, two shocks, the global financial crisis 
and now the COVID-19 pandemic, which are the two worst economic shocks since the Great Depression in the 1930s. Young people have therefore lost out economically relative to their predecessors and are definitely behind previous generations and issues from ownership to uh, student debt levels, as I have shown in my first slide. And this is before uh, we consider how young people will inherit the large national debt burdens that have been accumulated before COVID and also uh, right now with uh, the COVID-19. And these age divides have manifested themselves increasingly in uh, political preferences, with more and more elections around the world taking place along these generational lines. And here on this chart, um, so this is uh, the chart on the US elections, and the second one is on the Brexit. And if we look at these two biggest political decisions on either side of the Atlantic, the Brexit referendum and uh, the election of Donald Trump here, both saw such a divide along age lines to the point that a large majority of young people faced an outcome that they had not voted for. And here, this is my last slide. So here on this chart, uh, if we look forward, this first figure shows that over the last decade, less and less millennials are registered voters who are Republican. And the second figure looks at the millennial generation Z and younger cohorts relative to those born prior to the millennials in G7 countries. And in the US, so this is the chart for the G7, but in the US, it's nearly the same result as well. 2020 looks set to be the last elections where the millennials and younger have a distinct disadvantage. So we could expect a seismic change in the major election within the next decade and reverse policies that have favored those born before uh, 1980s. And this could include a harsher inheritance tax regime, less income protection for pensioners, for property taxes, higher to pay income tax, higher corporate taxes, and uh, very likely more redistributive policies. So this new generation may also be more tolerant of inflation, as it will erode the debt burden it is inherited, and put the pain on bondholders, which tend to have a bias towards the pensioner generation. So, even without an extreme electoral shift, as the left behind post millennial generations become more electorally powerful, this, this is likely to increasingly shape uh, the policies that we are going to have. And these uh, policies are very likely to be more mainstream and uh, probably less right wing policy as well. And I will stop there so we can have time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. That was great. And thank you for the very insightful slides. That's wonderful to see. Um, and I think um, well, it's time for our final speaker, Henning, who okay. will pick up. Hen can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Can you hear me as well? Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, let me say that I'm obviously speaking in a personal capacity, so don't hold the German government or Ministry of Finance responsible for any mad, mad thing I might say here. Um, so it's, it's obviously on a purely personal account. But at the same time, obviously, it was a very interesting time to start a two-year stint in government uh, at this time. I started in April, and ever since I've been um, involved in the fiscal response to the corona crisis, and in particular, the uh, schemes uh, designed to help SMEs. So, and I'll try to relate that kind of very up-to-date policy work to some of the topics we've been discussing. And at the same time, obviously, being the last speaker uh, is obviously bad because all of the good points have already been made by the uh, speakers before me. So I'll come back to Michael Sandel's book and also to Jürgen Habermas, um, but I'll try to be as brief uh, as possible. Uh, let me start with a few remarks on, on education and education in Germany. And of course, Michael Rosen is, is absolutely right. I mean, the, the PISA study 
uh, was a bombshell when it was uh, uh, presented. Uh, and he's also obviously right that there are uh, strong tendencies, especially also in some regions uh, of fascism, right-wing extremism, and so on and so forth. Um, and I would say in, in response to Ravi's um, argument that also in Germany, the trend has been to be to see a university education as the, the way to go. So I would say that's, a, that's been a universal trend and it's certainly been the case also uh, in Germany. A few years ago, there was a book called The Akademisierungswahn, uh, which is made exactly that point, that it's actually madness to uh, undermine the own uh, dual education system uh, with the apprenticeship scheme working so well. Uh, but, you know, that tendency has also been very present in Germany. And uh, it's also related to a political message because the idea of social mobility through education uh, has been at the forefront of social democratic politics for uh, quite a long time. So moving away from this is, I think, a quite tricky uh, concept. Uh, you can also see that a lot of apprenticeship uh, placements cannot be filled at the moment. So uh, that system is in uh, somewhat uh, is in some sort of transition as well, I would argue. And if you look at, at figures, for instance, about you know how many students take up a, a university uh, education, uh, it would also be worthwhile, I think, in the case of Germany to look at the University of Applied Sciences, which are normally not uh, looked at independently. Because here the, uh, the, the student numbers have almost ex have exploded over recent years. So I've just got the figures from 1999 to 2014. Uh, they more than doubled uh, in, in that period. Uh, and the, the growth is also expected to be uh, pronounced in, in, in the years to come. So that's a hybrid uh, sort of t higher education institution um, below a, a sort of standard Anglo a standard university that's based on um, sort of fundamental research, but uh, with a more applied uh, uh, outlook uh, for those who are not familiar with the system. So the, the growth in that particular part of the, of the uh, higher education sector, I think is also quite interesting. And also in Germany, I would say, uh, you know, the dignity of work needs to be reconceptualized in a way uh, that preserves the, the strength, the historic strength of the system, but at the same time uh, gives new impetus in one way or the other to that old promise of social mobility through education. So um, my, my point would be uh, that even in, in the German case, uh, based on your analysis, this uh, the German case has not been immune from the trend uh, that you have been uh, describing. Uh, let me make a few remarks on populism, respect, and, and dignity. And uh, it's, it's now almost three years ago, I think, when Peter, Peter Hall and I had this, uh, recorded a podcast at, at CES um, on exactly uh, that topic. And uh, I think it's by now become the mainstream opinion as well, and the mainstream research opinion that there is a, a mixture of, ec of economic and cultural reasons, and especially also the interaction between the economic and the cultural dimension uh, that have to be analyzed in order to get a grip on, on what is happening with populism. And uh, I was, I've been reading Michael Sandel's book recently, and uh, in many respects, I think it has been an eye-opener. Um, and especially when I read the, right towards the beginning, the, um, the part that he also attributes some of the blame to what has happened to the third way reforms of social democracy in the 1990s. I was immediately reminded uh, uh, about a, a, an article that Jürgen Habermas published on the website that I run a few, uh, a few years ago. Um, because Habermas made the point that effectively these uh, third way reforms uh, accepted inequality to a much larger extent than had, had been the case before. And he made the point that, and this is a quote, uh, this price, uh, the, the economic and sociocultural hanging out to dry of ever greater parts of the populace has clearly uh, given rise, uh, has clearly risen so high that the reaction to it has gone over to the right. And where else? If there is no credible and proactive perspective, then protest simply retreats into expressivist irrational forms. So he basically made the argument that you know, with this third way reform, uh, as no other political party has in that sense represented uh, what he called a wider democratic pluralism, uh, because he basically diagnosed a narrowing of democratic pluralism, uh, because there was no representation in the party political system, the reaction to what has happened had to go to somewhere else, and, and this led the way 
to, or at least help to bring about right-wing populism. It's an interesting thought that as an unintended consequence of the reform of social democracy in the 1990s, you might have given rise uh, to right-wing populism. Uh, but if you look at some of the reforms, for instance, of the welfare state, uh, some of the rhetoric clearly enshrined what Michael Sandel now uh, explained as the, uh, the tyranny of merit. Uh, one picture that I would like to refer to is the social trampoline, where uh, the welfare net ceased to be a net, but uh, it was ought to become a trampoline uh, because it was no longer a, a public insurance that basically insures you against life risk, but it was an enabling instrument that tries to propel you back into the labor market as quickly as possible. So in that sense, the, the, the rationale of the welfare state uh, had changed completely. And, um, and, you know, as part of this right-wing populist uh, surge, one of the key sentences that was very prominent in the Brexit discussion uh, has been uh, taking back control. And I think this is a, this is a very crucial mechanism. And uh, completely unrelated, I came across uh, uh, another uh, passage of, of, of Habermas in a different article uh, where he said, like all symptoms, this feeling of the loss of control has a real core. The hollowing out of national democracies that, until now, had given citizens the right to co-determine important conditions of their social existence. So, if you go back to Sandel's argument, uh, and even if meritocracy were achievable, and he makes the point that obviously in reality uh, it is not, it would still create this hierarchy uh, and attribute blame to those who don't make it to the top to the individuals who simply didn't make it because they are the only ones to blame. Whereas in reality, obviously, we know that there is no meritocracy and the game is stacked uh, for structural reasons against uh, people having the social mobility. So uh, I would say there is a triple effect as a result of this. So there is a lack of real agency, so the Habermas point, so we can't co-determine anymore these spheres of our social existence. While there is a, well, uh, the system gives you the impression that there is agency, you can make it if you, uh, if you work hard and play by the rules, to uh, quote another political slogan that has been used uh, quite a lot. Um, and when you don't make it, the, uh, the, the blame for the outcome is squarely on you yourself, on the individual. So I think this is an important backdrop uh, to bear in mind when, when starting to think about, I, th I think, what's a very strong point about Ravi's paper about dignity as a policy tool. I think, you know, this is where uh, you have to start. You need to define clearer where market or meritocratic principles should apply and where not. And where, um, you know, commons or public, uh, uh, public goods should be, should be uh, the way how, how the, the public life is organized. And as a second point, wherever possible, you should expand the, the scope of agency uh, in order to give back control or at least participation to people. And let me, when working in policy now, um, I came across very uh, anecdotal evidence, but I think it's very uh, interesting. It might very well give rise to uh, some research that I, I, I'm very interested to be involved in when, I, when my time in government is over. When we started to design the policy response to the corona crisis, the corona crisis is effectively a natural experiment because it's an exogenous shock where there is clearly no fall of the individual. So people, a lot of people fell onto the social welfare net through no fault of their own. And there is evidence as, as clear as, as possible that this is clearly not an individual that is to blame for this situation. And as part of the, of the policy response, we designed a system where we have a new grant scheme to help SMEs uh, survive uh, this case. But at the same time, because there is a path dependency in the welfare state and existing administrative systems, for those people who could not get short work benefit, short term work benefits, furlough and, and Kurzarbeiter Geld schemes, uh, there was a, a, a sort of opening up of the Grundsicherung, Hartz IV, which was effectively designed during this uh, reform of social democracy in the 1990s, right? And uh, it has been, uh, ha it has had a, a reasonably bad uh, reputation. Uh, but at the same time, during 
Corona crisis access and the way it's it's operated has been significantly simplified. So you don't you can have more assets uh, that you that you can uh, keep without you know losing your access to social benefits. Your existing flat the rent was paid for or even the mortgage was paid for, right? So obviously you didn't have to look for a new job. So all of these elements that have been uh, been perceived as as mean uh, they they're not in operation anymore at the moment. But at the same time, especially with self-employed people, we've seen a very strong resistance not to take up this offer. And uh, as an economist, you simply couldn't explain it because there is money on offer and people leave it there. And the, my working hypothesis is, and, and this was very clear when I came across a, a statement by one of the uh, people who, who are now unemployed and, and are not taking up the offer, is one of dignity. And that's why my argument would be, uh, it is not just about the individual, the, the problems underlying um, populism can also permeate institutions. And I'll, I'll tell you the quote, and this is from a Spiegel article where uh, she basically gave her reasons. She said, Hartz IV has a connotation of failure that you relate to yourself. I therefore prefer to call it ALG2, Arbeitslosengeld 2, uh, because Hartz IV simply sounds awful also to me. It is a dead end that you cannot escape from. I think the association is that you have hit rock bottom. You have the feeling that you have given up or simply have failed. So this is a case where somebody is offered governmental help through an institution that is perceived as being for the ones who fail to make it in the system. And we have now anecdotal evidence that actually the take up is resisted. And my working hypothesis would be the, the more your identity is defined by, say, economic thinking, the more likely you are to take up the help. We have anecdotal evidence that in Berlin-based startups, they actually write that in their business plans, right? So there is free money here, we'll take it, it's fine, right? But the more you move into the cultural scenes, actors, singers, people who, who identify themselves in their persona as contributing to society first and foremost, the, the further away from the economic reasoning you get, the more likely you are to find resistance to taking up uh, this kind of help. They would take less money from a different source than taking the money from this particular institution. So I think this is uh, also for public policy research, a, a fairly new phenomenon. Um, and that gives me actually uh, a reason to believe that some of the problems we are trying to deal with run much deeper than, than we, uh, we have conceptualized so far. Uh, because if you think it's just a policy fix is possible in order to address this, um, it's not going to cut it. I think the, the, the problems run much deeper. And to, I finish on, on, a, on, a, on a short sort of idea on, you know, what we could, what, what the dimensions could be to, to actually start to create um, dignity as a policy tool. I would say participation in economic terms. Make sure that people feel that they have their fair share of the gains of, of globalization. Second, I've mentioned that point already, agency make sure that you hand over control uh, uh, to the people wherever you can. And third, representation. Make sure that representation is there in, in the areas where there is no direct agency. So um, this is all very sort of anecdotal, but I think the, the corona crisis is a very interesting prism through which to look at some of these problems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henning, and thank you all the speakers. Uh, it was wonderful. I mean, I, I very much enjoyed the, the, the conversation so far. We have about 20 minutes left um, for Q&A, but I think I would first like to ask uh, Ravi to, if you want to, um, if, if you have any first thoughts that you'd like to um, get rid of, because it was all about your paper. So um, if you've got anything, uh, you'd like to share just in the aftermath of what I thought was a really productive and, and fascinating discussion, please do. Happily, um, although I, I, I'm, I'm mindful of the time and, and want to be um, respectful of everyone's time on the call, I wonder if Henning and Peter and Marion and Michael had expected to be on the call for 75 minutes rather than 90, in which case we probably have four minutes rather than many. So. Um, no, uh, sorry, no, no, it was, um, we're, we're on for 75 minutes. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so, so may, um, maybe okay. I'll just, yeah. 
Go yeah, on. so maybe I'll just share a couple of reactions and then we can let people go on with their evenings and, and afternoons. Because I think I think we just have a few minutes left. Is that all right, Eva? Okay, so just a few, obviously I can't in, in a few minutes react to all of the really thoughtful and insightful and often brilliant uh, commentary by uh, Marion and Henning and Peter and Michael. So just a, a couple of quick thoughts. Uh, one, I obviously should have read more Habermas uh, before I wrote my essay. So Habermas came up quite a bit. And so there's some homework for me to spend some more time with our dear Jürgen uh, as I make more sense of this. Um, just a, a couple of other observations, um, and one to Marion's point, and this has come up in part of the conversation. I think that the the pandemic is basically taking every inequality our societies had before and making them worse. Income inequality, racial inequality, gender inequality, everything that was becoming more unequal before has been made more so. Another question um, that has come up a lot, and I would say, the way I thought about writing this essay was to try to think about things that are actionable with policy stances that could plausibly be changed. And without, by the way, um, turning, trying to turn any country into Germany. Germany has its own problems. And I certainly don't think that even if Germany had no problems, which of course it does, and it has its own elements of, of frustration and disappointment, we couldn't pick up those institutions and put them somewhere else and expect them to work the same way. But I, I do see these challenges with discourse, which is really difficult to change. This question of, do, do you see me? Am I seen? Do you recognize my contribution? Lots of narrative changes could be undertaken to manage that better, but it's extremely difficult to imagine as a kind of policy choice, although it is a political choice. On the trade union question, I, I think that the revival of trade unions and embracing a more productive management labor relationship through them really ought to be one of the big lessons of the German case. And yet that's also not very amenable to policy action, as, at least as far as I can tell in the United States. And then on this question that Michael raises about a kind of rejection of liberal democracy, um, even more profound is a, a, this era of epistemological fragmentation, the inability of societies to agree on what's true and what's not true, which is part of this populist story, but even more foundational a question for democratic governance. Extremely difficult, as far as I can tell, to manage. And then the last thought I would just share is that um, we talked a bit about the emergence of a kind of right-wing populist backlash. But there's also a left-wing populist backlash at the same time in many of these same countries. And it has a different gender and racial and age composition. So the young tend to gravitate toward the left populist critique. Racial justice and, and gender justice questions are embedded in the, in the left populist critique along some of the same lines of, is this fair? Am I seen? Is, are my contributions being recognized? Whereas the right-wing populist reaction is much more focused on men, not on women and not on racial minorities, and certainly much less a question about, um, about the young. And so I worry that we're not gonna sort of age out of this uh, for a variety of reasons. If we think about the support for M5S in Italy, that skews very young. The, in, in fact, Le Pen's support skewed rather young, um, unlike for the Brexit and for the, the Trump election. And I think that that reflects this broader question, and now, now back to Habermas one last time, about what happened when the left and the right converged in the United States and Europe. When the moment came that it was almost indistinguishable the sort of quote unquote neoliberal policy perspective of the left and the right, so that center left and center right really had converged into a kind of embrace of globalization and accepting of it, the inequalities that tend to come with it. And here I would say part of what's most interesting, and this goes back to some of the more foundational questions, is just how entrepreneurial populists have been 
in taking advantage of the sense that neither the center left nor the center right cared about the people anymore because they had converged into this sort of neoliberal consensus. Forgive me for using the word neoliberal again, but everybody knows what I mean. And so in that sense, Trump is not really just a right-wing populist, nor is Le Pen just a right-wing populist. They've sort of mixed and matched between some of the traditional concerns of the left about the working class and the traditional concerns of the right about cultural identity and national identity. And so that, I think that is a really important part of the story. And when we, when we bring that into the conversation as well, I, I feel more worried rather than less about our progress over time and more concerned about questions of integration of all of the population into this feeling that the system is fair or at least fair enough. And I've already run us over time. So uh, I will certainly stop there and just thank you again, Eva. Thank you for the team at Global Policy. And thank you to Michael and Marion and Henning and Peter for spending some time with this paper. I am really grateful. I took lots of notes and I'm excited to go back and, and uh, look through them. Thanks, Ravi. Thank you for your, your closing comments. I'm going to keep the room open for another 13 minutes or so because I think people may want to ask questions, if that's all right. We've got one, um, one here from, from Marian, actually, whether you might share your presentation. Um, I don't know what the best way of doing it, uh, Marion. I don't know how you might want to do it. I can share some slides. I, I, will, I will send you the slide I can share, yes. Yeah. So is there anybody in the room who would like to come in now, um, raise a hand and Tom can probably see it, I can probably see it. And, and I will, I'm happy to stay, but I think we should let Peter and Henning and Marion and Michael head off to, to whatever they're going to do next. Yeah. A few more minutes, I think we can, if, because people may want to have questions. Do, does anyone have questions in the audience? Because uh, people are still there. Everyone's incredibly shy. I've seen a few colleagues in <laughs> are not asking questions. Um, uh, Tom, can you see? Is anyone all good? Okay. okay. Did very well. We had we had a good thirty-two participants the whole way through, and people have only just begun to leave, which is quite impressive. So. <laughs> well, they're still there. So, is anyone? So, nobody seems to have any questions, which is rare. Have we silenced everyone? Um, to the part, to the other participants apart from Ravi, any any would anyone want to weigh in one final time before we close the session in a couple of minutes? In that case, if no one's going to ask anything, no. <laughs> oh, it's probably Wednesday. Um, the feeling of midweek. Well, in that case, I will close the session now. Um, and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, Eva, Eva um, foolishly, since there are a couple of minutes to fill, um, uh, I, I would like to say a little something about dignity. Okay, I, yes. I, I went rather quickly over dignity. Right. One of the, the, the things that uh, is worth uh, spelling out, and I think it's come out very, you know, very, very interestingly in the course of the presentations, is how reflexive dignity um, is being understood here. So um, one of the things about dignity that can sometimes set it off from um, just general questions about status is that it's both about being acknowledged and about how you see yourself. And I think um, where, as we, you know, we, we go all the way back to Adam Smith, Adam Smith, talks about place, that great object that divides the wives of aldermen, you know, that, that he says it's the cause of... So, so it's not a new uh, thing to think that status and, uh, and, and place and so on are of inestimable um, importance to, in, in thinking about politics. But I think perhaps the, 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 the most uh, interesting thing for me that came out uh, of Ravi's contributions and others is that um, you know, this, this version of, of, of thinking about um, status and, and, and place is about how one sees oneself. And I think that that does have some policy implications because it's a, you know, we can, uh, we can go back to Gilbert and Sullivan where, you know, in, if, if anyone knows the gondoliers where everyone's going to be 
uh, of the highest possible status. There's the uh, Lord High Vagabond in the stocks and the Lord High Coachman on the box and all of the, the rest of the things. We can easily start attributing status to people, but it's the way in which they attribute status to themselves. Um, now, it may have been once upon a time that work was the thing to do it and that we need to revive um, the, the, the dignity through work. But as Eva has, has, has very rightly told us, um, this was already uh, a, a, a picture of, uh, of, of status and self-recognition, which was highly gendered, uh, you know, when we're in a world which is, uh, are we going back to that world in which the breadwinner, male or female, becomes the person who esteems themselves? It seems to me um, that her valuable point is that, we, that, that if, we're, if we're thinking of this as a, as a crisis of uh, how people see themselves, um, it can't just be a story about work. Okay, so just some rambling thoughts to fill in a few couple of minutes that Eva still grants us. Totally fine. I, yeah, that, I mean, that's super. I think um, I'm sort of with Michael on this. So, um, uh, oh, there's, there is a question here. How much do you think that it is also a question of empathy and understanding of different viewpoints? Um, I guess, does, it, does Helia, do you want to just uh, spell it out? Because I'm not sure whether it means it's about dignity or something else. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. It's, it's more about how um, there seems to be a lack of empathy on different viewpoints. So rather than listening and understanding to say someone else's view, whether they're uh, Labour or Conservative, whether they're pro-immigration, anti-immigration, and it's and it's more about how society's lost that kind of um, appreciation for different viewpoints and how much that is affecting populism at the moment. That there's just a uh, a lack of appreciation for uh, multiple viewpoints, and that that kind of fires people up into this type of tribal um, positions. Um, thank you. Does, do any of the speakers want to respond to that? I, I think it also feeds into Michael's point about um, the, the loss of a liberal consensus as well, right? That, in other words, a functioning liberal democracy only functions well when different viewpoints are taken seriously and respected and, and interpreted somehow. And I think there, th therein lies the bit problem of what I would consider to be fragmentation and, and, uh, or a crisis of liberal democracy in, in different kind of worlds. So um, yes, I, I, I suspect the, the issue would be then whether it's an institutional uh, problem or whether there's something deeper than that, where, whether liberal democracy as we know it of the 20th century has run its course. Um, does, <laughs> well, I'm not sure it has, but Seems yeah. To have. yeah, I mean, how, how, do, how do we go back to and how do we start listening to each other would sort of be the question. Jimmy, mm. move forward. Yeah. Maybe I'm, I'm, oh, yeah, go ahead, Peter, please. I, I, just want, I think this is an extremely good point. And um, I, in response to it, I, I simply want to say that um, I think you're right. Um, uh, and I think there isn't an easy solution. Um, uh, but, but I'd want to uh, argue, maybe as a political economist, that um, this is not unconnected to the economic situations that people find themselves in. Uh, there's a way in which um, the perception of economic threats uh, tends to uh, lead people, as psychologists would say, uh, to uh, uh, erect stronger boundaries between their in-groups and their out-groups, uh, so that I think that, I think you're entirely right. And uh, um, so, my, but my first point would be, well, how do we, if we want to improve this, we also have to think about um, improving people's economic situations so they no longer feel quite as threatened as they otherwise would. That's not so easy in the context of a technological revolution. We're living through a technological revolution. It's easy for people like me to say, oh, we should make sure more people have decent jobs. Um, but it's harder than that phrase would tend to suggest. The other thing that I'd say in response to this is um, 
you know, a rhetoric matters. Political rhetoric matters. Uh, uh, political symbolism matters. Uh, it's not so easy to control that in um, any world, including the world we live in. Uh, and uh, the world of social media may be making that worse rather than better. Uh, but um, how we talk about others um, turns to some degree on how uh, prominent uh, people, including political leaders, talk about others. So I think your point is extremely well taken and identifies um, a, an issue here that, like many of them, is quite intractable. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think if nobody has a pressing question that they really have to get rid of, I, um, we are ready to close the event. And um, once again, thankful to all of you for making the time. Um, uh, Tom, thank you for hosting it in the background. And uh, yeah, can I just encourage everyone to, um, to keep writing for global policy really, <laughs> so that we can have these wonderful discussions on the back of these papers. Um, I must admit, it's probably one of the, we haven't done it so often, so I'm, I'm really pleased to see that it does work. And it's, it's um, as, as an editor, I'm pleased to see that this, this um, has uptake. And um, thank you all for your time. If there's anything, you know my email, so please, Keep in touch as well. Um, and thank you, Michael. I know we've been in touch separately, but it was great that you could join.